I had the honor of meeting uh, Brigadier General retired um, Walid Rawi um, two years ago uh, in Cambridge. And uh, immediately we had um, an immediate friendship um, with each other. And uh, I invited him to come to Israel. So we, at that time, we couldn't really know that we will have Corona and uh, we'll have to see each other uh, through Zoom. But I think that the invitation is still uh, valid. And once Corona is over and once the lockdowns will be uh, uh, over, um, I hope to see Walid uh, here. Walid has yes, yeah. been a senior, a senior officer in the Iraqi army. He reached uh, the rank of Brigadier General and he was the head of uh, the Directorate in the Ministry of Defense uh, until 2003. He left Iraq in 2004. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, as we will here later on from Walid, he uh, started his uh, career as an officer in the Iraqi army, eventually reaching the uh, rank of uh, lieutenant in the uh, very prestigious and elite Republican Guard of the, um, uh, of the Iraqi army. Um, Walid is a born storyteller, and I think that no one would be able to um, uh, give us the experience of service in the Iran Iraq war than better than Walid. You, Walid, have been uh, in the Iraqi army, you were an officer during the Iran Iraq war. So I would like you to uh, tell us uh, more about your personal experience as an officer from the beginning of the war to the very end. The floor is yours, Walid. Oh, thank you very much, uh, my friend, for this invitation. Thanks for the center. And before I start, I just want to mention a point that's very important for my friend Pisat because he said three, three months before the war started, he was nominating in this department in charge with the Iraqi the army. Uh, and my, I don't know, it's randomly comes or planning because three months before the war, there is a big meeting in Baghdad, which is in June 1980. And this uh, meeting uh, been invited the, the commanders of the corps divisions with the Minister of Defense and General Chief of Staff. This is exactly in June 1980, three months before the war started. And the, the, the main goal for that meeting is retrain the troops, retrain the Iraqi army troops. Second, prepare for a war. And this is, of course, came because of the revolution, exportation of the revolution, we know. So I'm just mentioning to this point, is our friend Pisah, he came suddenly three months or here. I mean, Israel received some information about the meeting that Iraq prepared for the war so that they concentrate on Iraqi army. Actually, uh, you know, I, as a, an, uh, you know, uh, uh, professional officer. Uh, I, I am uh, proud I served with the uh, three, in all my uh, life in the army service, with the three uh, very famous senior officers, generals, and not Iraq, even in Arab countries. I served uh, as a secretary for General Sultan Hashim, the last Minister of Defense. I served three years with, uh, he's my relative, General Ayad Harawi, he was a commander of the Republican Guards, and later on they put in the commander of Quds Force, or Army. And I served one year with General Shenshev. So even my experience, it was small, because during the Iraqi Iranian War, I actually I graduated in January, 6th of January, 1981. So I directly I was nominated to be uh, an officer in the 10th Division, Armor Team, the Wat al Nasr, they call it. And it was in the south sector, in Amar, in Misa, as a tank platoon commander. I served there, and in that uh, period, when I was in the 10th Division, I joined actually uh, two uh, battles of one. It's raid. Uh, it was in, uh, in 1981, October. There is a small town called Dahlaran. Uh, so it was raid to there. 
And then uh, in, in, in October 1982, it's big war. It is Zbedat Shahani, when the Iranian control in this area, Zbedat and Shah, uh, Shahani, which is an Iraqi uh, in, in the um, uh, sector of Amara. I was as well in the 10th Division. Uh, then I moved to uh, to uh, 17th uh, Armored Division, which is they called Quwat al Abbas at that time. It was in the midst sector because the relative, my relative, the Brigadier General, he was Ayad al Rawi, uh, he uh, ordered uh, the officer administration to move me from the 10th Division to be his personal secretary in this division. We stay actually there till uh, uh, end of. Uh, uh, 1994, uh, then uh, he moved, he, they transferred him from this uh, division to be a, a commander of uh, a sixth division in the Basra sector. So I moved with him. Then in uh, October, 11th of October, 1984, uh, uh, sorry, 85, we've been, uh, the, the Iranian invade, uh, 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 called the Azir area, which is uh, south of the Amara, between Gurna and Amara. Uh, uh, they called the operation of uh, Dijla, actually. So uh, it was like uh, they invade this area. So we was a counter-attack unit. And this battle called Taj al-Ma'arik. Taj al-Ma'arik. So uh, I joined, of course, I in, in this war. And then uh, in 1968, uh, uh, in, in 9th of J uh, February, uh, I was uh, in the, as well, in the 6th Armored Division when they ran in Vettel So uh, our unit was like counter-attack forces. So I was uh, in that battle and we stopped them because their goals is go north to Basra and go west to Umqasr. Uh, and then uh, after uh, maybe less than a year, I moved uh, to uh, transfer, uh, moved me to Republican Guards. Uh, they called Quwat al Medina al Munawara, which is the uh, Medina Munawara, it's like, uh, you know, Yasser before. <laughs> uh, 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 as armored uh, division, uh, I moved there. And in, uh, in January 1987, January, 9th of January, in South Sector, uh, they call it uh, Al Hasad al Akbar, or like biggest harvest. It was really bloody war because the Iranian, they, uh, they are planned to invade Basra itself. So. We call it the Shalabcha sector. So uh, we was in the Republican Guard and we stopped the army. It was a bloody army. Imagine uh, brigades come and when enter in the battlefield within five minutes destroyed. Thousand as thousand get killed. Without the Republican Guard, the, the Iranian could uh, easy control on, on Basra. So I was in that Medina Munawara. Then uh, 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 when uh, my relative, uh, he nominated as a commander of Republican Guards, and it was his mission because he told me uh, when uh, 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 President Saddam called him, I said, Ayad, I need you, from you liberate foul. So I, uh, when he moved to be a commander of Republican Guard, I was an officer in the Medina al Munawar, which is one of the division of the Republican Guard. So I moved him as his personal secretary. Then we, uh, I joined, of course, uh, uh, the liberation of power, which was in 17th of April, 1988, which is, uh, uh, as my our friend Pisaki uh, mentioned, this is like the final step or phases of the war because there are four phases, you know. And then I joined uh, all the others. We call them in Arabic, Tawakanna uh, Allah, which is liberation of power after liberation of power, in 25th of May, 1988, liberation of Shalamcha. It is in the uh, south sector. Then uh, 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 Majnoon Island, where's the, the oil field? It was in 25th of June. And then we go to Zubaydat. When you remember, I told you I've been in the 10th division when they uh, controlled Zubaydat and Shahani. We liberated in the 12th of, uh, of July. And then the final one, it was in middle sector in 22nd of July as well, 1988. Then uh, Khomeini, he drink the poison. Thank you very much. I couldn't hear anything, sir. So if any so question. Hear, I, hear yes. yes, now you hear, hear me? OK. Um, yes, no. I would like to ask you some questions about your personal experience yes. um, spending all over the world. Yes. Um, 
Where was the most difficult times during the war? Can you describe what it means? Uh, I guess you would say that this was Karbala 5 or the Hisad al-Akbar or the big harvest, but what did this actually mean? Can you describe the, uh, uh, the, the being, uh, being there and facing uh, human waves and, 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 and fighting uh, in these conditions? Yeah, the the biggest uh, harvest. It is. Uh, it was really. It is really bloody. I mean, uh, even you, uh, through my experience, are uh, my commander experience, not just my my small experience, which I joined ten or seven uh, uh, battles. Uh, imagine uh, uh, first point. All Iranian. Imagine all the Iranian forces. The siege. Sapah Pazdaran and the army, they called Artish. They came in this. It is, it's really a small triangle area. If you go to the map, here is the, we call it the, uh, this is uh, Jasim River, and here is Shat al Arab, and there is, is lake of, they call it uh, uh, Fish Lake. It is, uh, and it is very small areas. All the Iranian army, all Iraqi army there. I saw before we came here, uh, actually in that time, all the units except the 10th, 11th division. In that time, the leader of 11th division, his name is Abdul Wahid Shannan al Arbab. By the way, he's a Shia guy from Sumawa province. They was okay. I mean, they stay in their post and position. The others collapsed, nothing. And uh, then uh, the army sent the 6th division destroyed within 24 hours. Send the third division, destroyed. Infantry, I, I saw my eyes before we came because we start to uh, our operation after maybe three, four days because there is no way. Uh, we should know that Republican Guard, it is like the, the Joker or the last card of the president. They call it uh, the strategic reserve in the hand of the Saddam. So when we be involved, that means that's it. There's nothing left behind us. The morale in Republican Guard, it's unbelievable. I mean, when the tank stop in this certain post, whatever is the enemy's attack, a human being waves, etc. whether he killed them or he died, you cannot go back for one meter. So the morale is great. I remember there is one uh, hundred something name of the uh, brigades, which is around a thousand and two hundred soldiers or more. Uh, when we guide them to enter to the battlefield before we came, as a Republican guard, destroy. Imagine five ten minutes destroyed completely. Uh, the the commander he told me uh, the commander he told me guide uh, the the tank one of the tank of. Uh, the 10th uh, Republican Guards to their post in the front. So when I went there and showed them exactly on the river of the Harjasin, and I came from the street, this is Central Street, and this tank unit, it was on the left of that side. I, I show him his, his place, and then I go left. I saw a lot of injured on the floor, on the ground, sorry. And the commander, he's hiding in one front. I said, sir, please evacuate these injured people because this is effect on the morale and a lot of death from this uh, army. He said, I am not able to move myself. So it was really, I mean, their morale, the army, it is nothing. There's a really a very nice joke. After maybe 15 days, the situation is stable and the command, uh, I mean, the uh, Saddam or the headquarters or the Ministry of Defense, uh, they decide because the situation is stable in, the, in this war. I mean, there is no uh, heavy fight. So the, this is, uh, the uh, President Saddam decide to withdraw our unit. Actually, uh, in the Republican Guard, in this war, just two divisions. But that division, led by General uh, Kamel Sachit, he been executed later on. And our division, led by uh, General Ahmed Hamash, he, he passed away in Jordan with Harper after the invasion. The only, not, the, not all Republican guards. So, uh, and the, the, the division supposed to come instead of us, replace us, it was this, the second division, 
number three, I mean, and Turka Tanya, the second division. It's in Petri. So I was standing outside. I used to smoke, having a cigarette. And the office, intelligent officer, he was a colonel from the second division. He's my friend. He said, Captain Walid, uh, why you bring us here? He said, it's not my, I, I'm not calling you. Saddam, he said. He said, you are Republican Guard and I Revolutionary Guard. So Revolutionary Guard, fight Republican Guard. Why we are being inside? <laughs> he said, so actually, this is uh, more, 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 uh, uh, I mean, heavy time when you see these people. Uh, I remember uh, there is a brigade called 46. Uh, it was uh, before uh, the uh, Iranian attack. They was have a sector in the 11th Division. And the commander, he's my friend, by the way. I think he's now in living in Istanbul. His name is uh, Brigadier General Ya'mur Zekel Khayru. He's from Mosul. All his unit destroyed. All. No, he, none of the soldiers left from his uh, uh, brigades. So he was hiding in the headquarters. The, the, uh, the enemy, Iranian, they didn't reach him. And he cannot withdraw because he's afraid of he's going to be executed. So our commander talked with the Minister of Defense, which is Adan, when he visited us. He said, sir, there is a, a, a headquarter of the 46 uh, brigades. It's in the front line. And they are surrounded. And he cannot return back because he believed that they're going to execute it because all his unit damage. He said, OK, give him amnesty and call him. We sent General Ra'ad al-Hamdani. You know him, General Ra'ad al-Hamdani. He was a colonel. And we said to him, please go and bring, evacuate uh, Colonel uh, Yam. So this is the most uh, difficult uh, situation or war I've been. Yes, sir. Now, um, can you describe a regular day and the routine of a regular day of uh, somebody like you who was an officer during the war? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned in my uh, resume, uh, I, I served as a fighter in the front line and in the headquarter of the division of the corps, which is different. The routine is different because when you were in the first line or the trenches, of course, we, we, uh, we keep all, all the night uh, because, you know, you, usually the Iranian attack us during the night after midnight. So in uh, alarm uh, uh, situation, warning situation, till the morning. And then after that, we check all the tanks in the, my unit, whether I was a company commander or a platoon commander, and make sure everything is all good. Then uh, uh, make sure if there's any shortage, uh, that we check the battlefield around the, the post. And then we have some rest, except the people who's uh, in duty. And in 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, uh, usually they, the, the, you know, the food, the dinner, and the breakfast that comes from the, uh, from the main base unit behind. And then uh, uh, after that, uh, we do some maintenance in the unit because you know, in, in this area, in this state, uh, maybe uh, Colonel Bisakhi knows that, especially uh, 1980, let's say 81, 82, mid of 82, the armored unit. They you being in, in engaged in the front line, which is a big mistake. And then the, the leadership or the commander, they found this is a big mistake because they should to be back as a reserve or counter attack unit. Uh, so that they start to evacuate the, or uh, withdraw the, the armed troops from the front line to the back. And in this stage, we always spending the time for training. We have training courses for, you know, for the armor that's uh, driving or a gun or uh, the wire or, or, or tactics. So when the units in the back, uh, uh, not front line, back lines, uh, uh, it is uh, always spending with the training. But when I was with the commander, of course, the Republican Guard, actually we start our duty, one hour is uh, sport, doing sport, uh, playing basketball. <laughs> And then we go to the dinner, uh, sorry, breakfast at eight o'clock. After that, of course, we had the, uh, uh, the commander planning, told us a day before. Colonel says, tomorrow at nine o'clock, I'm gonna visit this unit. So we go this uh, visit unit. Each commander I serve, I serve closer to, uh, uh, as I told you, in the field with the, with the Ayad, he was the commander of uh, 
sixth division i served with him and i served with him and as a commander of uh, republican guard plus i was closer to the commander of al Madinah al-munawwara because i was uh, uh, an officer in his uh, office uh, each one have his different uh, let's say strategy or behavior or program i mean for instance general ayad always he concentrate on the moral number one is moral number one he covering all the shortage of the soldiers even he's ready to pay from his pocket uh, one battle because uh, he have a rolex car uh, watch and uh, he said wait what we have to give this soldier gift i said uh, we will send he said no now i said i have someone he said no he took his rolex car, uh, watch and give it to the soldier so each commander have uh, uh, general i always when he go uh, ask the soldiers what is your lunch and he ordered the commander i need a, a, a sample in, uh, in Iraqi, they call Namuna. Namuna and it's Turkish name, by the way, which is like a sample of the food. In, in the Turks, they call Namuna. And in Iraq, we use it as, they call Namuna. And I remember once we visit a, a brigade, it's called uh, 504. Uh, uh, it is, this, uh, this happened after the war. I mean, after the ceasefire, when he was general chief of staff. And this uh, brigade, it was in the sector of uh, Khanaqin. And, but it was not in the front line because, you know, after the war, only the, the border guards, the border police, uh, it's in the front. They are behind. So he asked the, the commander, can I have a sample of the food that the soldiers, they had mm. lunch? Mm. Uh, sorry, dinner time. And so they, they brought him soup and rice and bread with meat. He said, wow, really? This is the soldiers? He said, yes. And he told me, Walid, Take uh, and the staff officer with him, go to the kitchen, find out this is really, it's being cooked for the soldier. When we went there, the, the chef, he said, sir, I didn't receive anything to cook today. And this food has been provided to the command, that John Chief. It's from the restaurant, officer restaurant. So when we came back, the, the John Chief, he arrest this colonel, he ordered, and he is de deported from the army within a minute. He calls Saddam personally. So you see each uh, commander control, uh, sorry, interest uh, in certain things. Uh, with Ayad, first morale, so that when you go to the conclusion of General Ayad, with this, this five, six battles after we liberate Fao, imagine from, from September till July, we destroy the army, Iranian army. We destroy the besiege and Safah Pazdaran, then the Khomeini said, I'm drinking the poison. Yes, sir. Uh, Walid. Yes. Um, I, I remember that one of the difficulties of uh, soldiers during the war was not being able to go on leave for a long time. Uh, how, how long did you, did you stay in, in your unit without going on leave? Yeah, I put it here. I, I say uh, actually in, uh, I mentioned the Badani Sharhani battle when the Iranian, uh, I was in the 10th division, I stayed 52 days, 52 days completely without any vacation, 52 days, which is uh, around two months. Yeah, because since usually we receive a warning before they attack, so they stop the vacation and during the war and then they cannot open or allow the soldiers and officers go for a vacation unless they're going to be stable completely, 100%. So I say 52 days and continually. Whereas usually the routine is every, every month you have seven days, the officers, which is every 21 days you have seven. Soldiers, every 30 days they have seven. Yes, sir. I couldn't hear you, Ronnie. Now, uh, what was the biggest achievement you participated in uh, during the war? Well, actually, uh, the uh, your liberation of how it wasn't, uh, I mean, this is very important, very strategic, because it is effect completely on the morale of the Iraqi people, uh, morale of the, of, the, of the army as well. So that you see the taking after, of foul. 
Yeah, the I'm telling you, Shalamche. Do you know what did, we did? Shalamche, we attacked them, or we uh, we we started our counter attack or uh, the war or the battle. Uh, as I th I remember after uh, afternoon, two o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, two two hours before that, there's a we put a loudspeakers on the trenches facing the Iranian. We said, hey, within an hour we we're gonna come to invade. So you know, <laughs> see the I mean the power is there. Even, I'm telling you, even, uh, the, you remember when we liberate, um, this is true, actually. After we liberate Kuwait, especially the Republican Guard, the prince, uh, the prince of, the Emir of Kuwait, Jabr, Jabr Sabah al Ahmed, Jabr, he sent in each single officer in the Republican Guard a personal gift. <laughs> I remember for me, it was a big TV. And two system, Paul and Sigan, which is brand new. Of course, he don't, he doesn't know my name, but he called the Minister of Defense. And that time, by the way, you know, uh, Adnan Khairallah, he was the minister. He had very close friends with the Kuwaitis. I am sure if he was uh, still exists, he's not, you know, had uh, passed away by the accident, Saddam couldn't invade Kuwait. So for instance, mm -hmm. he told him, he said, Let's, okay, we have 3,000 officers in Republic. He said to each single officer again, so, you know, liberation of power, it was the fact not just on Iraq. Iranian, you see, uh, within within three months, the army collapsed, destroyed. Yes. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, the person that experiences something that's always uh, missed when uh, somebody else is talking about uh, the, the Iran Iraq war. And here we have an example of some, but I wouldn't save you uh, one story because you told me, I, mean, I want to end this uh, interview with one story that has nothing to do with the Iran Iraq war. And it's one of the most incredible stories. And I, for all those of you who uh, left us uh, during, uh, I want you to be back because this is a story you've told me right at the beginning of our meeting in Cambridge about an Iraqi officer who served in the expeditionary yeah. force who was uh, here in 1973 yeah. and fought yes. in the Golan. Yes. Can you tell us this story? Uh, I was secretary of the Minister of Defense, Sultan <laughs> Hashim. Yeah. I received a call from Minister of Trade. He's Rawi as well. He's living now in Jordan. He was the last Minister of Trade, Mohammed Mahdi Rawi. By the way, he graduated from Stanford University in, in Manchester. He told me, uh, Walid, I said, yes, uh, doctor. He said, one of my relatives, his relative, he, from the same tribe, we are uh, Rawa, I am Rawi, Rawi is a, is a, is a town, uh, not a tribe. But my tribe is Rifai, originally. We have a branch in, even in, in, in Israel, in, in, in Jordan, in Egypt, in, in Syria, and Lebanon. So he told me, this is my relative, his relative, he is a retired colonel. His name is Harush Rawi. Harush. The name is very famous to me because I remember this officer. He was in the uh, in the 12th uh, Armored uh, Brigade uh, uh, in Jolan Heights, and we uh, we hear that he was a war prisoner, uh, and he was disabled because his leg has been. So I told him, sir, okay, send it to me. After one hour, he came to me. Uh, he sit with me. He said, "Sir," I said, "No, I supposed to say to you, sir." He was a co uh, He was a, a, an officer in 1973. What is your problem? He said, "The, uh, the Ramadi camp we call Al Warrar. There is a camp in Ramadi called Al Warrar, where the, next to the dam, they have uh, accommodation for the officers' houses, for the uh, the army officers. So uh, they give him one of them to live, uh, which is free." of charge because he was a retired colonel and then he received an order he showed me the order that he should evacuate this one he told me where can i go i said okay so uh, we uh, i write the notes and i went to the minister i told him this harush rawi he knew him very well because uh, i mean uh, the minister he was a captain in this in the cobra war and uh, anyway i said this is his is a problem one two three and he said, wow, really? So the uh, minister gave me an order to call the camp in uh, Ramadi. And this officer, he remained in his house till he died. Imagine, for long. 
So when I give him the order, he was he is really happy. Oh, really, Walid? And then he asked me, Walid, which branch of Rawi? Because Rawi, they have four tribes or four branches. I said, I am from Al Sheikh Rijab, they call us. He said, I'll tell you this story. He said, when I was, uh, when my tank attack in Jolan Heights, they took me as a war prisoner. And I was in the hospital. And my leg is damaged and completely, and they decide for uh, operation amputation. So in the evening, the surgeon make a tour. And we was a, a prisoner from Asia, from Syria, from Iraq. You know, you remember a lot of uh, war prisoners. So there's an interpreter with the surgeon. And I sign a, an, a document because, you know, this is go to the Red Cross uh, to agree about the amputation operation. And then he, uh, interpreter, uh, the doctor asked him, where he from? So I told him I'm from Iraq. So the surgeon stopped, asked the interpreter, which part of Iraq? He said, I'm from Ramadi. In that time, there is no Ambar, they called Ramadi province. Then the surgeon came to the, the Harush. Uh, in our Iraqi accent, they tell him, which part of Ramadi you are? He said, I am from Rawa. He told him, do you know General Pasha Ahmed Rawi? He's my father uncle. He said, yes, he is one of our leaders. He's one of, he was alive in that time. He said he saved the Jewish in Baghdad in 1941 in May. Whereas you remember the revolution by, 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 by El Gailani and he was supported by the German. You remember this story in May 1941. And these, the same people now, <laughs> they attacked the Jewish neighborhoods inside Baghdad for looting and killing. My uncle, he was the, was the general, in, I mean, he's the commander of the Iraqi police. So he said, this General Ahmed Pasha Rawi, he saved the Jewish. Because of that, I will treat you and you will be one of the first war prisoners go back home. He said, every day, his family visits me and give me, you, uh, you know, new clothes as a gift to me till he returned back home. This and he saved story. his leg. Yes. The, the you know, I'm, telling was you, not I'm telling you uh, truly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, believe me, when I was in the service, one of my best friends, I cannot remember his name, but he was the head of the Jewish community in Iraq. His name is Abu Suham. He's, he has a printing uh, house. I used to meet him, walk with him. He's, you know, he's Iraqi, he's Jewish. Even in that time, I remember he told me, uh, this is actually maybe, by the way, he get killed by Egyptian guy in the synagogue in Baghdad, if you remember this story. He's one, he's one of the honest people in the field of printing. You know, any problem between business, between the printing houses, publishing houses, he's like the judge. He's very respectable guy. And I remember it, in that time he told me that uh, the only uh, uh, Jewish families uh, remain in Iraq till maybe 1994, they are 70. 70 family. So we as an Iraqis, I mean, uh, by the way, when you're talking about the army, you, maybe you heard about the conference happened in Cairo, where Churchill, he'd been there, and uh, Jafar al-Askari, he went to discuss with the British to build the Iraqi army. One of the Iraqi delegation in that meeting, he was Sassol Hisqail. I mean, Sassol Hisqail, the Jewish guy, the budget minister, he agreed to give the budget to the new Iraqi army. So yeah. this is a, we are a human being, you know, live together, you know. Yeah. Well, yes. I, by the way, I tried, I tried to locate the, um, the, uh, the doctor who, uh, um, um, who, who saved the leg of uh, that Iraqi officer. And unfortunately we couldn't actually locate him. Um, I asked some people who could know but unfortunately, they could not uh, locate an Iraqi, uh, Israeli doctor of Iraqi origins who, uh, but that's an amazing story, one of the most amazing stories I ever heard. Um, and um, yeah, should be you know, I, 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 my, my, my father's uncle and uh, some of them, I mean, Ahmed Pasha, I, he passed away in 1974, I think. Uh, so 84. I heard a lot of story from him and from his brother as well. 
his brother, which is my father uncle, he was the last ambassador, last ambassador in Iraq uh, he, uh, in 19, in the revolution of 14th of July. He was in the airport waiting for King Faisal to come to join the meeting of Baghdad uh, camp uh, back mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And they told him to my uncle that uh, the king is being killed. He said, I'm not going to go back to Iraq. He passed away in Geneva. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the famous uh, lawyer, uh, solicitor in Iraq. I heard from him so many times. Most of his stuff, they are Jewish, Iraqi Jewish. Mm -hmm. There is no problem, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even uh, some of the Iraqis' idea, I mean, this is frankly, they believe that the Iraqi Jewish, they are in that times. I mean, uh, they don't want to go to Israel, even they invited, you see, because they live normally and with respect, you know, uh, they are, you know, Iraqis' roots. And it's a, in Anna, where I come from, uh, because we are from Anna, but originally from Rawat. And this is the picture behind me is Anna. You see, <laughs> this is Anna. <laughs> Anna, my father told me, till 1948, half of Anna city, more than seven, 500 houses, a Jewish lived in the east side of Anna. And they are normal. I mean, relationship. Even my father used to, uh, I used to drink al arak uh, Arka mm -hmm. in, in the Jewish area. They have colors with red or green. <laughs> so, you know, they are just normal relationship as... Once when you so come here to Israel, I'll uh, let you meet some of my well, uh, friends well, from uh, whose origins are from Anna. Yeah, uh, one good. of them even wrote a novel recently in Hebrew, unfortunately, so uh, it's uh, not available in any other language yet. Uh, he said that it's, it is being translated to Arabic, uh, and oh, I hope good. it will be published in Iraq. And it's a novel which happens in, in Anna. Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll be I, I'll, I'll be happy really to to talk with Ben. I'm, I'm yeah. sure he will know my family because yeah, course, yeah I'm course. I'm sure. If, uh, if someone wants to ask a question, one of our uh, distinguished uh, speakers, so this will be a a great opportunity to do so. I want I want to ask um, Brigadier Walid Al Rawi about uh, the way that. The Iranian, the enemy, was depicted in the mind of the Iraqi soldiers. How you were motivated to fight, and did you? I mean, your uh, the officers or the soldier ever wondered what are the goals of this war? Of the war. Yes. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. This is a very important question because I, I, I it was in my mind to mention to one point. I remember, for instance, in Basra, when we arrest some uh, soldiers, war prisoners, and we asked him, where do you want to go? He said, I'm, I'm going to, to liberate Jerusalem. I told him, well, damn hell, you are in Basra. Do you know where Jerusalem? So this is, it was like uh, the uh, ideology. Saddam, or let's say the government, Iraqi government, constraint about the war, it's uh, Arabic Iraqi war and Persia war. The Iranian, it's make it holy war. It is against infidel regime, circular regime, which is Al Baath party. And they use a liberation of Palestine or Jerusalem as a main goal. I mean, they, they the matter is for their soldiers is not just to let's say liberate Basra or export the revolution. Because they call their soldiers, this is the first stage. The second stage will go to Jerusalem. This is one. I think, uh, uh, by the way, there is uh, today at three o'clock or 10 uh, uh, in your time, uh, I record, uh, I was uh, in, in uh, a program about the war. It's been broadcasted by Al Arabiya channel, today and tomorrow. Sorry, Friday and Saturday at 10 o'clock in Middle East. You can see it is in Arabic. I talk about this issue. When we was in, inside the Iranian territory, uh, even I remember I have a soldier. He's from Kuwait. I mean, he's Sunni from Ambar. Uh, before we go inside the Iranian territory, 
I remember it was Ramadan. Uh, he was fasting. When he was inside the Iranian territory, he wasn't fasting. I said, why Jabbar? He said, we are invading, so this is not good in Islam. We are invading you, so we are not allowed to fast. Anyway, the first vacation he escaped from the army. He went to Saudi Arabia. When we withdraw to the Iraqi border, the holy fight it was Iraqi because they start to attack us. They start to invade Iraqis. So the morals change actually in this stage. When you, Mr. Fred Pisach, he mentioned to the war before we withdraw to the international border. The moral of soldiers, I feel it's not that much because we are invading the Iranian. This is what, because we are inside Iraq. But when we decide, in spite of Iraq agreed on 29 uh, uh, resolution, decision by Islamic uh, League or United Nations to agree or stop the war. And all these initiatives being refused, rejected by Khomeini. When we withdraw to the, our border, the morals change and the goals was set to defending on our land because now this is an Iranian aggression to Iraq. So in general, the agenda or the morale or the agenda we use, uh, the Iraqi government use, it is uh, that. Uh, because when you go back to the, uh, maybe we didn't mention this is actually, uh, uh, actually uh, be, uh, in, in, in exactly in the 4th of July, of uh, uh, September, 4th of September, uh, the Iraqi air defense attack an F-5, lead by first Lieutenant Hussein Ashkuri, shot down in the mid sector. This is 18 days before 22nd of, of September. So this F-5 is be shot down in mid sector on 4th of September. So the Iraqi agenda in the media said, we are defending Iraq against the Iranian aggression. I had a question. Yes, sir. Um, so, in fact, you sort of, you start to touch upon it, uh, Ustad um, you My question relates to the timeline. So, of course, um, a lot of my education has been in English. I'm a British Iraqi, but there is this emphasis on sort of 22nd of September being the, uh, the uh, start date of the conflict, whereas we know the Iraqis refer to it as Yom al al Iraqi, the day of response, which tells us that there are events preceding that date that are very rarely focused upon uh, in the media, and often that creates a narrative that perhaps keeps the idea of Iraq as a warmongering state in check. So I wondered if you could just comment on that, because I think everyone present today is well aware of the border clashes, but most people don't know this. Um, and so often Iraq is, you know, till this day uh, depicted as the aggressor. The other question just relates to defections during the, the, the war um, and whether you could comment on that because that didn't feature in your discussion. But it's fascinating to hear because of, of the time um, Khomeini was issuing a number of edicts trying to get the Shia component of the Iraqi army to rise up against the regime, which of course didn't happen. So it'd be really interesting if you could comment on both defections and the refusal of the Shia to betray their country at the time um, and why that is. Uh, I will start this uh, uh, about the Shia. I, I remember the first uh, uh, one of the main uh, media conference has been held by the Minister of uh, Defense, Adnan Khairallah. Uh, I remember it was in the, the, uh, the new building of the officer club inside Baghdad. And uh, there is a journalist from Egypt. She asked, uh, she asked him, about the uh, same, what is the Shia told in the same. He told her, you can go to the uh, cemetery of Najaf. You will see how much dead from the uh, soldiers sacrificed by themselves in this war. Uh, uh, maybe if we will go to the, I mean, uh, th that war, why, 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 why the war started? Maybe some of the uh, expert or researchers said that uh, 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 it's a matter of uh, uh, export of the revolution. Because what's happened is before the war, Khomeini sent a message to Mohammed Bakr Sadr, one of the leaders of Shia. Because uh, uh, Khomeini, he received an information or a message that Sadr 
uh, he's surrounded, he's been arrested twice, and then they release him. So he want to leave Iraq. Maybe he planned to go whether to Lebanon or to uh, Iraq. So uh, he told him, Khomeini told him, he sent him a telegram through the, the normal uh, communication uh, facilities, devices. I mean, so the government that received the telegram saying to him, Khomeini, stay in Iraq. You believe the leader of the Islamic revolution in Iraq. You see? So this is one. And all the uh, agenda, Khomeini's agenda, it's with the Shia. So the Shia, this is your time, this is your revolution, this is so on, so on. But in the main times, uh, uh, the regime in Iraq or the government or even the army, we concentrate on not sectarian issue, not Shia and Sunni at all. I mean, I remember my first commander, he was Shia. My com company commander, he was Shia. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, I mean, high rank officers, they are Shia and they are really well, well fighters in the war. Because it's a matter of you doing your duty as an Iraqi army, one. Second point, we are not in charge with the politics, whether Saddam have his own reasons or in his uh, you know, main concern to start the war or the Iranians start the war. This is not our problem, not our, our, our business to discuss this one. The main point is how we do our duty, whether we are Shia or Sunni. So that during the war, we never uh, uh, saw in the army, I'm not talking some from al Dao party outside the army as an oppositional, but inside the army, we never had any sectarian problems between Shia and Sunni. Even one single occasion, no way. All Iraqis uh, defending the country from, and I told the, in, in the last question about uh, when we withdraw to the Iraqi border, uh, there is no excuse. Maybe before that, some people talk, as I give an example, he was a surgeon, uh, soldier in my unit. He said, sir, this is, uh, we, are, we are now, we are, we, are, we are invading Iran. And this is an Islam, no. It's not, you cannot do fasting, etc. even pray maybe. Yeah, I don't pray, I don't fast. Anyway, so this is the point. So the Shia, uh, uh, yes, Iran trying to play on the Shia agenda to Iraq, and Iraqi uh, uh, attack back. It's a national issue, national war, not a sectarian war, not Islamic war at all. Even they try to, uh, to use this agenda as Islamic war and on Shia and Iraq. And I remember in Al uh, Hassad Al Akbar, we talk about this one, the biggest service. Uh, uh, he said because they are, was closer to the Basra, Shalamcha, very close to Basra. By the way, Shalamcha was, uh, you imagine the, the, the war, it was nearby the University of Basra and Shalamcha. So, how closer to Basra? Shalamcha is the University of Basra. So, at, I, I heard it in the media. Uh, Khomeini said to the Basra Shia, hey Shia, be ready, we are coming to liberate you from the regime. We are just across the river, Shat al-Arab. When nothing happened, there is no, let's say, a, a movement or uh, accident or any uh, uh, activities from the Shia and Basra. He started bombing Basra. I remember one day, seven, more than seven something bomb on the civilian neighborhood. So this is, they try to use the agenda of Shia and Sunni in Iraq, the agenda that was Iraqi and Arab against Persian. And uh, this is the question. Uh, what is the other one? Sorry, can you... Can like the timeline of why did the war start and was the start date the 22nd? And why there's, um, you know, the need to sort of reiterate that in international media that it was the 22nd. Okay. Yeah. First, to stop the export of the Islamic revolution to Iraq and Arab Gulf, because they said so. As I told you, before the war started, he sent a telegram to Muhammad Bakr said, stay in Iraq, don't leave Iraq, you will be a leader of a new Islamic revolution in Iraq. So this is one. Second, dropping the Algeria agreement. You remember Algeria agreement, because Algeria agreement is being signed by Shah and Saddam. Saddam was the deputy. 
And this point, actually, it's like a, a, a physiological problem to Saddam inside him. Because he gave half of Shat al-Arab. You remember, Shat al-Arab, it used to be controlled both sides by Iraq. I mean, any ship comes through Shat al-Arab should rise the Iraqi flag. According to Algerian Algeria uh, uh, agreement, we give them them. And according to the depth point of Shat al-Arab, we call it Taluk, Taluk points. So it was like a, 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 a physiological problem to Saddam because he gave Iran half of Shat al-Arab. Third point, which is very important, rebuilding the home front against the Iranian threat, which adopted a Shia sectarian. Because the agenda of Iran is, as I said, Shia and Sunni. When the war started, we start to rebuild our Iraqi nation, gathering Shia and Sunni, facing one enemy, it is Farsi enemy sometimes, or any point. Third or fourth point is, uh, you, according to the agreement between Iraq and Algeria, there is two places I served there in mid -September. We call them Saif Saad and Zain al -Qubs. This is two areas. According to the agreement, the, uh, this area is being occupied by Iranians. Saif Saad, Saif Saad and Zain al -Qubs. Uh, Till the war started, they didn't give it back to Iraq. So they so saw they that Saif Saad and Zain al -Qubs. It's a mis not the big Musa and the little Musa islands that belong to Saudi. That these are different areas. No, no, it's different. This is this is first in mid sector north of uh, Mendeley, and this is uh, uh, it was mentioned to the agreement between Iraqi Algeria agreement uh, that this area should give back to Iraq. Till the war started, they still in the hand of the Iranian. The Iranian refused. So when we start the war, we liberate them. It's exactly north of Mahran city. Fifth point, this is actually just a little people mentioned to this point, I'm gonna see. And I heard it from senior general, because this has never been mentioned, even in the plan, it was a plan, which is liberation of the Baristan region. And we remember when we go to Abadan and Muhammara, the, re the main reason is not cotton or oil field in Abadan, it is the Control, liberate, we said, liberate the Arabs and Ahwaz from the Iranian occupation. So this is the, the, uh, the fifth point. Uh, sixth point, it is uh, weakness the Islamic regime uh, and preparing the condition for regime change by the Iranian opposition. Even in that time, we just had, the regime, Iraq regime had good contact with the opposition al Arabistan. Not Mujahidi Khalq, because Mujahidi Khalq, which is Mas'ud Rajawi people, they came to Iraq in 1986, not before that. Of course, uh, uh, Saddam, he tried to, uh, to be like a regional superpower, regional in the region, as a, so that, uh, you see, it's come later on, we invade Kuwait. So this is like uh, main seven points, which is, uh, uh, the war started. Even in this point, we said, uh, till Iran, they start the war by attacking the... I remember my father, he was uh, 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 um, director of the police of uh, Misan Amara, my father, in 1955. Uh, and when he heard about the war, he said, what's Saddam Stewart doing? This is a problem between the border, you know, attacking the back here. It's not, no, it's not a new even when Iraq was kingdom, and after that, always there is a challenge in the border between the police and between the, uh, the border guards, between, it's not go with the, with general law. Yes. Khalid. Yes. The, the pictures I mentioned at the beginning that I saw, the Iraqi soldiers celebrating, taking uh, uh, Iranian uh, stronghold was in the operation of uh, Zain al Kaos in on the yes. 7th of uh, September by yes. the 6th Armour Division. Yeah, that's right. This is it, exactly, this is what, one of the main goals. Exactly. The 6th Division uh, go in this mid sector and liberate this area. And we celebrate because we are turned back. Exactly. Uh, and, we, and we liberate. Later, and a few days later, the 10th Division uh, attacked the same side the area and took it also. and. And then came another series of, of some uh, places. Uh, yeah, that's right. 
that uh, you took back uh, because uh, the Shah did, did it back because of the agreement. Yeah. Actually, when we go to the, uh, the, the plan of the first day of the attack, the priority of it was liberate this area. Because you remember, and you know very well, that then the, the 10th Division moved from the sector to the, to the south, to Amara. Yes. But when they put, uh, it was first two points, actually. And each sector have this in his own goal. For instance, in the south, we will go to liberate Ahwaz and Arabistan area. In mid-sector, we go to this Libreya uh, Senecos and Sersa, and trying to push back the artillery of the Iranian to not allow to attack Khanaqin or Mandeli on the other area. Yes. I would like I would like to add uh, to to uh, what Nazli has asked about uh, September twenty second because this is something I wondered about. And I've read uh, through Iranian media and newspapers, and they were really engaged with talks about border incidents that were happening for many months before September. Uh, even uh, from March to September, there were many incidents in the yeah. border. Uh, so it's not something that happened just on September, but what yes. made September 22nd, I believe, as the marking point or the starting point of the, of the war. And this is also something interesting. When I go through uh, the documents from the UN, they are talking about the Iran-Iraq situation. They are not saying war. I mean, the word war is coming into use a little bit later when they realize that it escalated to something longer. But... Um, I know that I believe that uh, September 22nd is because of the um, joint attack from the air and from the ground of Iraqi uh, military getting into Iran. So still consider it to be an imposed war on Iran. It's not considered to be uh, uh, an Iranian uh, aggression to attack Iraq. Uh, actually, when you go to the United Nations document, Iraq has submit more than 600 something uh, mm -hmm. reports to the United Nations about the accident. It's, they call it aggression mm -hmm. from Iranian side to our border line. This is already, this is one. But uh, as a logic, I mean, when you have a, this a small accident in the borders, it's not supposed to rise to have a major war. You understand my point? Mm -hmm. I mean, even there's an F5, this is an eighth of uh, 18 days before 20, 22nd of September, shot down in Hanafi, uh, which is, we believe this is big. I mean, it's not artillery or shotguns between the borders. It is an F5 came and attacked the oil field, uh, oh, sorry, oil refinery in in Hanafi. So, but you remember, we, I mentioned in the last question about some reasons. These reasons, uh, uh, encourage Saddam to have this opportunity to start the war. I mean, yeah. first, yeah, it's true. I mean, first, uh, uh, Khomeini sent a message to al-Sadr, be a leader of Iraqi Islamic New Revolution. Second, uh, the declaration of exportation for the revolution to the Gulf as well. Even the Gulf support Iraq, like Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. Uh, is it true that, that uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Hassan al-Bakr, uh, who came before Saddam, you know, at the time the government was changing hands, of course, um, is it true that he sent a um, amic amicable um, telegram to Khomeini, sort of congratulating him for coming to power, and then gradually we sort of we see a change in that because it becomes clear that they don't want uh, positive and healthy relations, but they want animosity between the two? Exactly. Exactly, and uh, I can send you a copy of that telegram. Uh, he told him congratulations for this revolution. And in Islam, in Quran, there is a verses uh, uh, when you said "Assalamu ala man ittaba' al huda." That means uh, uh, "Salam, shalom" to who believes. Who believes? When you answer somebody with this verses, that means you believe he is not Muslim. So this was the answer of Khomeini to Al-Bakr. <laughs> so Al-Bakr get mad, you know. You know, when you said some, some assalam, usually when you say shalom, you say shalom. But when you said, when you said, when you said, when you said uh, Al-Bakr sent a telegram, 
congratulations for the revolution. And then the Khomeini backs told him, Assalamu ala man taba al huda. That means you are not Muslim, so I, uh, you should be. So this answer, this is during, uh, actually, during uh, Bakr time, not Saddam time. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, with the first days of the revolution. Uh, mm -hmm. I think as well we could add, you remember, because uh, Saddam or the Iraqi regime forced uh, uh, deportation uh, for the Khomeini uh, because it, according to the call from Shah, so uh, they call him to leave. So he left to Kuwait, the Kuwaitis didn't allow him to return back to Baghdad and then next day he flew to, to France. Even Saddam Hussein asked one of his uh, colleagues about what do you think if Khomeini, he go to Iran, leave Iran from Baghdad? How this could change the situation? Um, Walid, can yes. I ask you a que uh, two questions? One yes. of them is uh, about the uh, total number of ca Iraqi casualties uh, during the war. Uh, for a time when we were trying to assess uh, shortly after the war, the casualties, there was an agreed number. And then in 1989, Iraq built a memorial near Fao, the Fao Gate. And the number written on that uh, gate was 52,194 yeah. Iraqi soldiers who died in FAO, which yeah. actually, made, which actually uh, changed our total assessment. Because if only in FAO, like half the number of the original assessment died, then the, the total number is much higher. Then the second question is, what do you, how do you remember the last day of the war? What were you okay. doing on the last day of the war? Yeah, uh, uh, per, the question, actually, I have in my, because I have a lot of documents about it. I know the numbers exactly. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not under my hand. Maybe within minutes I will text you. But in general, uh, the dead body, the dates, uh, we are lower than here. And the Iranian uh, uh, yeah. soldiers get killed more than us. But the war prisoners, we are more. Yes, yes. So the war prisoners, we have more war prisoners in Iran than they had, you know. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the, the kill, I mean, soldiers get killed, the Iranian more, actually. Mm -hmm. I think more than half million, at least, at least. But I have the numbers exactly, because I remember we have this number. Mm -hmm. Just in Power 52, that's right, casualties, it's true. There is a, big, a picture, I cannot remember, I have it showing uh, it's like it's not from satellite mm -hmm. uh, the the area of uh, you can find the hole of a bump every half meter every feet imagine mm -hmm. you see so in fall yeah man. but in general the the war prisoners uh, we are more than the iranian the uh, the soldiers get killed uh, the iranian more than us if i may uh, say a word there are two versions. I found two versions about the numbers. Yeah. There is a minor version. Uh, General Hazraji, for example, mentioned it in his book. Yeah. And also, uh, some American sources are saying that there were no more than 120 or 135,000 killed. And there is another version which speaks uh, about uh, bigger numbers, uh, like General Samurai in his book, and also in uh, other American sources. I was speaking of more than 300,000 killed and uh, the double number of uh, injured uh, uh, during the war. I think, uh, uh, yeah, more than, uh, I have the book of Hazrati. Yeah. No, they are more than that because we, our friend Ranin, he just mentioned, just on 52. Yes. So it's more than uh, approximately half of what Hazrati said. No, they are more. They are more. And how about the last day of the war? What do you well, remember? Well, actually, last, last day I was, I was a Republican guard, and we heard from the news that uh, the uh, Khomeini agreed to drink the poison. We told him cheers. So we start to shoot, and there were, you know, we, we burned the sky with the shooting, even with the, with the guns of 55, 57 millimeters. And the air defense start to shoot. Everybody happy, you know. But some. We actually made tears on the on the eyes and crying people because of not just stop the war, because of the casualties, the people who who die. Each Iraq. And by the way, my 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 brother-in-law, which is my my wife's brother, 
his first lieutenant, his engineer, he get killed in the war. So uh, uh, no single family have uh, victims, whether war prisoner, whether soldier or officer get killed or disabled, unfortunately. And then the problem is there is very, uh, I mean, really very, uh, this is the point actually, me, even I, I serve in the army as a, as a professional officer, not uh, even when I serve in, by the way, when I graduate from staff college in, uh, in, in January, 6th of January, 1992. And uh, by the way, there's a Palestinian, he was with me. He is now the governor of Ramallah, Yunus Abul As. He was with me in the college. Mm -hmm. <laughs> General Yunus Abul As, he's from the uh, Abu Ammar's uh, party. <laughs> Uh, actually, in, uh, uh, when I uh, usually when you go to the staff college, you should return back to the or your own unit. Uh, which unit? I well, I went to staff college from the Republican Guards, so I supposed to go, but they refused the security uh, administration of the, the Republican Guard because they found I have brothers. Actually, I have a brother. Uh, my father sent them to study because my father he was against the regime. So I have brother, he's in Tennessee. He came here in 1968-76. I have brother in, uh, in uh, Florida next to me. He came in 1971. And I have brother, he passed away. He was in England. He was a prof in the Bradford University. He passed away by cancer uh, in 19. So I said, hey, your brother's in America. And you're not going to go to the Republican Guards. Uh, this is normal. But my, the point is, make me change all my belief or respect. After Saddam invaded Kuwait, I was in the staff college. He uh, uh, ordered or he sent a statement in the media to Iran. We agree about Algeria agreement to make them imagine, agree. And then he, uh, like mean, he, this point allowed him to withdraw the troops, even it wasn't in the front line and then take these cops to be engaged in Kuwait and make the Republican Guard withdraw to the borders. So then why we fought eight years? It's not because of Shat al-Arab and etc. Why after that, he said, okay, I agree to return back to the Algeria uh, agreement to set up the peace with the, with the Iranian. And this is really a stupid issue. Unfortunately. Yes, sir. I would like to ask a question. Yes, sir. When you were in Iran, did you notice any enthusiasm to, uh, among the Arabs towards the um, Iraqi army? Well, I'm telling you, uh, when I was in the South, even in Amara, there are some Arabs, uh, Arab Stanis. You mean uh, uh, Iranian Arab, that's right? Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, some of them, uh, there was, uh, 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 especially in Amara and Basra, uh, uh, they came to the government and uh, especially they joined Al Ba'ath Party as an Arab and they forming their unit to fight. And there is a big camp in Al Misan in Amara for training them, these Arabs. Uh, and uh, this is one, some of them they've been used as interpreter, translator. And some of them be used as, uh, you know, guide, direct the troops when, especially the first day when we, they go to Muhammad and uh, Misa. Uh, some of them, they, especially in Amara, accused they are like double agent, some of them. But it wasn't that big number to be arrested or executed. There is a little bit number. I heard about that, but I saw some of them. They was trained and they, uh, they have some operation. Uh, I remember when I mentioned to, it is raid to Dahlaran in the 1981, I was part of it. There are some Arabs with us, guide us to this area. Yes. I, I was wondering, uh, during the war, uh, Saddam Hussein ordered the execution of several high-ranking officers, including division commanders. Yes. Can you describe what kind of influence did it have on uh, Iraqi officers at that time? Uh, actually, uh, first point, most of the officers been executed uh, 
uh, in general, uh, they are, I'm talking about the high rank, they are experts. Uh, I mean, for instance, when the Iranian invade Muhammad, liberate Muhammad, and uh, the sector, it was the third corps. The commander, he was General Salah al qadi He's from Anand. And his main uh, division for counter-attack unit, uh, it is the third armor division. And the commander, he's a Kurdish guy. His name is Ajwad as Even his father is very famous Kurdish uh, sheikh of his tribe. And because they, uh, I mean, uh, when they studied the situation and they didn't decide to attack directly after the, the Iranian across uh, uh, Karun, and they said, okay, let's wait until they came, concentrating, and we do. And then the Iranians start to expand and control till they liberate Muhammad. In that point, Saddam ordered to execute General Salah al Qadi. He was a two star, three star general. And General Juadas Achitna, he was two star general. Uh, this is, of course, his effect. And in the mid sector as well, I remember one of the battles, Mahran, as well, he executed some uh, officers. Actually, uh, some, people, uh, some of them, they've been sent to the, the jail. M mostly, uh, I mean, it's effect on the moral for the other special forces, people they are, they know they are professional, they are good officers, they are honest. They are faithful to their duty. But sometimes the battlefield is give different circumstances. So check the situation. Maybe you believe in this path and the other believe in that one. But the problem is after they uh, been executed and then after maybe a year, so Saddam ordered to give them all their rights as a salary, as a gift, or certain stupid things. I, I just want to suggest uh, one point, as long as uh, the center in charge or uh, with the Iran special. Actually, I published a book about, uh, it's in Arabic, I will send you a copy, about the, uh, uh, the besieged and the Safah Pazdaran in Iraq, the ex ex Iranian experience build militia in Iraq. My new book is going to translate the second one. It is concentrating or we call it al-Mirisha al-Wala'iya. Wala'iya means which you follow Khamenei only, which there are nine big militia and 13 small militia. This is my second book about uh, this point. I'm now uh, trying to translate it to English to publish it. So if it's uh, my suggestion, if it's able to have a, in the future, uh, like a, a workshop about the uh, militia in Iran, because my second book, I not just concentrate on the militia in Iraq, even I concentrate the militia or uh, Sabirun, which is the Palestinian militia. And uh, the Shia start to spread their uh, activities in Gaza sector and etc. So it is good to have a seminar about uh, this point. Okay, so we will take this into consideration and uh, we will plan it and we will invite you again. Um, I'm, I'm, I am happy, I am happy anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we would like to thank you uh, sincerely for uh, taking the time and for accepting the invitation. Uh, I believe that we could have uh, sat here and uh, made this conversation even longer, uh, but uh, we are already uh, almost two hours. Uh, so I would like to thank you again, both uh, to you, Pesach, and to you, Walid. Shukran. Uh, Shukran. And to all of you that, who uh, stayed with us for uh, the entire time, thank you very much. Uh, and we will be happy to see you in our uh, next session in two weeks. So uh, stay safe and um, we will see each other again. This is not goodbye, thank only a farewell. Thank, thank you very you. much. I am proud of that to be invited in this uh, workshop. Thanks for my friend Ronin and Bisat and you and our colleagues. I am happy anytime. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Shalom. Shalom. We shall be in contact. Please. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.